Welcome to Darien Library. Uh, I heard that it stopped raining, so I'm glad that you are all here and you all look relatively dry. Uh, I would like to just briefly mention that programs at Darien Library are made possible by our annual Friends of the Library campaign. So thank you so much for your continued support to make programs like these available to the community. We have a very special guest here today. Uh, today's guest has been published in several literary journals, including North American Review and The Sun. In 2006, she was one of three fiction writers who received the New Writing Ventures Award. And in 2007, she received a generous Arts Council grant to write her first novel, Tell the Wolves I'm Home. She is originally from New York, but she currently lives in England with her husband and three children. So she's visiting us from quite far away today. And the book that she's here to talk about today, for anyone who is close with a distant relative or distant with the close one, June's relationships with Finn, Toby, and Greta will strike an unforgettable, gut-wrenching chord. This is a tender portrait of the different degrees of love and grief, the threads that become unspooled between us, and two sisters working their way back to one another. And just to give you some background as to how we <laughs> had our guest here today, uh, so when this book came out last year, I think I was just asking my staff or my colleagues who was the first to read it and sort of discover it amongst our staff, because I think nearly everyone here has read the novel, almost everyone who works here. And uh, it's just sort of started to spread like wildfire. And really, our staff just couldn't shut up about it. And we pushed it on many of our patrons, some of which are here today. Yes. And uh, it actually, through happenstance, our guest's father was in the library. I think he comes here on a semi-regular basis. And he told his daughter, he was like, there's this library in Connecticut that is really obsessed with your novel. <laughs> so when you're in America, like maybe you would want to think about swinging by. And she was telling me before this, she was like, well, since it's a debut novel, whenever I hear about a library or bookstore that really likes it, I just try to come to them if I'm in the area, because, you know, why not? And I was like, that's great. I'm going to start tweeting at more authors to tell them how much we love them. Uh, so anyway, that's how we got her here today. She's in North America just for a brief stint, and she decided to swing by our library, so we're so grateful to her. Please join me in welcoming to Darien Library, Miss Carol Rifka Brunt. So let me know if, it, if you can't hear me and I'll, I'll shift over there. Um, thank you all for coming. It's really nice. It's, you know, a great day, at 4 o'clock. So I'm amazed that so many people have come out and it's fantastic. And thank you to Darien Library for being so enthusiastic about the book. That's, that's wonderful. Um, and what's great about coming now, as opposed to a year, a little more than a year ago when the hardcover's out, is that actually some of you might have read the book. So, when I leave plenty of time for a Q&A, um, you'll actually have questions that are about the book, um, and I can, I can answer whatever you want. Um, so I'm going to do some little readings, um, talk about the process a little bit, um, talk about some of the characters and some of the things about the story. Um, I'll do little readings. I won't bombard. <laughs> so and I'll try not to do spoilers, because I kind of realize not everybody has read the book. So I'll hold back on getting too deep into it back pages of the book. Um, so I'm just going to start um, by doing a short reading, just starting right at the beginning. My sister Greta and I were having our portrait painted by our Uncle Finn that afternoon because he knew he was dying. This was after I understood that I wasn't going to grow up and move into his apartment and live there with him for the rest of my life. After I stopped believing that the AIDS thing was all some kind of big mistake. When he first asked, my mother said no. She said there was something macabre about it. When she thought of the two of us sitting in Finn's apartment with its huge windows and the scent of lavender and orange, when she thought of him looking at us like it might be the last time he would see us, she couldn't bear it. And, she said, it was a long drive from northern Westchester all the way into Manhattan. She crossed her arms over her chest, looked right into Finn's bird blue eyes, and told him it was just hard to find the time these days. Tell me about it, he said. That's what broke her. I'm 15 now, but I was still 14 that afternoon. Greta was 16. 
it was 1986, late December, and we've been going to Finns one Sunday afternoon a month for the last six months. It was always just my mother, Greta, and me. My father never came, and he was right not to. He wasn't part of it. I sat in the back row of seats in the minivan. Greta sat in the row in front of me. I tried to arrange it like that so I could stare at her without her noticing. Watching people is a good hobby, but you have to be careful about it. You can't let people catch you staring at them. People catch you, they treat you like a first-class criminal. And maybe they're right to do that. Maybe it should be a crime to try to see things about people they don't want you to see. With Greta, I like to watch the way her dark, sleek hair reflected the sun, and the way the ends of her glasses looked like two little lost tears hiding just behind her ears. We were stuck in traffic near the George Washington Bridge. Greta turned around in her seat to look at me. She gave me a twisty little smile and reached into her coat pocket to pull out a scrap of mistletoe. She'd done this for the last two Christmases, carried a piece of mistletoe around to pounce on people with. She took it to school with her and terrorized us at home with it. Her favorite trick? was to sneak up behind our parents and then leap up to hold it over their heads. They were not the kind to show affection out in the open, which is why Greta loved to make them do it. In the van, Greta waved the mistletoe around in the air, brushing it right up into my face. You wait, June, she said. I'll hold this over you and Uncle Finn, and then what do you do? She smiled at me, waiting. I knew what she was thinking. I'd have to be unkind to Finn, or risk catching AIDS, and she wanted to watch me decide. Greta knew the kind of friend Finn was to me. She knew that he took me to art galleries, and that he taught me how to soften my drawings of faces, just by rubbing a finger along the pencil lines. She knew that she wasn't part of any of that. I shrugged. He'll only kiss my cheek. But even as I said it, I thought of how Finn's lips were always chapped to shreds now how sometimes there would be little cracks where they'd started to bleed. Greta leaned in, resting her arms on the back of her seat. Yeah, but how do you know that the germs from a kiss can't seep in through the skin of your cheek? How can you be sure they can't somehow swim into your blood right through your open pores? I didn't know, and I didn't want to die. I didn't want to turn red. So that's how the story starts, and actually, What's quite interesting, um, I'll just say that writing a first novel is kind of you teaching yourself to write a novel. I don't, this is actually my first novel. I don't, a lot of writers have about five novels under their beds. <laughs> they um, just were novels that taught them how to write novels, I think. Um, but this actually was my first novel, so it was very much a learning process. And one of the things that amazed me was that first bit that I'm reading, that I've just read, and the first paragraph in particular, that stayed from, you know, over probably three to four years of writing it, that first bit, the whole first chapter, really was the beginning of the novel. I think most times people write the novel and you're kind of feeling out, realizing what the story is, and you look back at the beginning and it's no longer really the beginning of the story. So, but in this case, it was, it's, al it's almost identical. I dug it out from my computer a little while ago. It's a 700 version, 700 word version of this story and I would just, as I was going, go kind of slot more stuff in, but it's the exact same, the mistletoe, the driving down to the city, it's all the same. Um, so a little about, a bit about the process. Um, I've been writing short stories for quite a few years. Um, semi, well no, not successfully, <laughs> um, to be honest. I mean, I, I had a few that were okay and I published a couple short stories, but um, I would labor and labor at them, but they didn't have what I think this book has, which is the emotional connection. I never wrote a short story, the characters never made me cry, I never wrote a short story that anyone told me, you know, that was, that made me cry, that made me think or feel or, so I think they felt more like exercises. But while I was doing this, um, one day the idea of an uncle, a dying uncle, painting a final portrait of his niece came to me completely unbidden. It had absolutely nothing to do with the work I was, the, the stories I was writing. Um, it was random, and I, but there was something about it. I kind of shelved it in the back of my mind and thought, that's an interesting thing, there's friction there. Someone dying, didn't know what he's dying of. Um, 
and a niece, like a way, I have this feeling of a way to keep yourself in the world, keep something of you in the world a little bit longer, making this portrait and this connection. Um, and over the years, so I kept writing short stories. Over the years, I would have a go at that story, the, the Uncle Niece story. I'd write stuff, but it wasn't right. It would be, it would be dead. It would, it didn't have. It, it wasn't letting me in. If you, anyone's a writer here, if you know what I mean. Um, and then one day, June's voice was there, uh, said, saying basically the first line. We were on our way to our uncle's that afternoon, having our porch painted, um, and that was my way into the whole story. And it just kind of opened up to me. Um, started out as a short story and just I knew there was so much more there and so um, I just kept adding a thousand words a day, adding and adding and letting it kind of take me where it was going to take me. Um, the one thing that I was quite wary of was the cliche autobiographical first novel thing. Um, it's set where I, it's set in the time that I was a teenager in the place, Westchester, where I was a teenager. and. I really kind of did everything I could to try not to have that be the case, but um, that's where it wanted to be. It was, I kind of realized at some point that her uncle didn't have children. That was why he wanted to paint a portrait of them. Um, and then I kind of just thought gay, and then I thought 80s, AIDS, and it all kind of came, puzzled itself together, um, and the logical place to set it was New York, and, and the tension of the story one of the tension of the story is that suburb city tension. The girl in the suburbs looking at the city, and the city represents, I don't know, I mean, you are all from kind of similar areas, pretty similar to Westchester. Um, that idea, I mean, you're here, it's very far from the city, psychologically, I think. Um, AIDS, anyone who lived through the 80s in this area, AIDS felt very far to me. It felt like a city thing, and I was a <coughs> suburban person. Um, and so I really loved that tension, and it was something that I, I thought would just worked really well. And I finally just had to say, okay, you know what? It's a cliche to write an autobiographical first novel, but I'm just going to go with it. And when I finally let loose to that, it was, it was actually a gift because I could really inhabit that place in a, you know, it's always I always think of novels as you're kind of like a snowball rolling down a hill, and you're picking up bits and pieces. So that. That Westchester isn't, there is no real Westchester that is like that, but it's loads of little teeny images, little things that my memory hooked on as I was writing, you know, compounded into, into that work, that Westchester that I put in there. That, there's not a specific town, for instance. I grew up in Pleasantville, but that's not Pleasantville. That's not Mount Pisco. That's not, it's some very strange fictional composite of all those places. Um, so, the way the story goes, June, who I've just read a bit about, um, loses Finn quite early on. That This isn't really a spoiler. It happens maybe page 10. Um, he dies of AIDS. And she's, he's basically her best friend. Um, she's, she's a geeky girl who likes to wear medieval clothes in the woods. Um, and surprisingly, <laughs> so I was just talking about, it seems like a lot of people like that. <laughs> I get letters from people saying, oh, I was you. That, that was me in high school. <laughs> and I was like, well, where were you? We would have been friends. <laughs> I thought, I, I definitely was thinking that was just me. So, um, but, but it's great to hear there were other people out there. Um, but she's pretty, she's pretty distraught when she loses Finn. Um, and soon after, she starts getting contacted by a man. She sees him at the funeral, and he's kind of hanging on the edge, not coming in. Um, and soon he's, he's asking if she'd meet with him, um, and she's reluctant at first, but um, the way he poses it to her is, I'm the only other person who misses Finn as much as you do. Um, and maybe this is a little spoiler, but he, he does turn out to be Finn's um, long-term partner who basically June was never told about, um, which is both a little bit exciting because he might have all this information about Finn, but also incredibly heartbreaking because um, she's then not his best friend in the way she thought she was. She thought she was she was his everything in the same way he was hers. Um, so there's, but she agrees to meet with him. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. So I'm, I'm doing the thing that you're not supposed to do. I'm just let it go. <laughs> um, she meets. 
meets with him. This is a little bit down the road after she's she's still incredibly skeptical about him, jealous of him, and um, wary. But um, this is the first time he kind of comes looking for her. The next time I saw Toby, he was waiting for me right outside my school. He was sitting on the hood of the same small blue car I'd seen him get into at the funeral, which I suddenly understood was the same car I used to see parked outside Finn's building. I always thought it was Finn's car, because sometimes he'd go down and get things out of the trunk, like canvases, or once a green raincoat. When Toby spotted me, he stood up next to the car and started waving his long arms around like crazy, like he was shipwrecked or something. A rush of pins and needles shimmied up my back because even though I knew how wrong it was, I was kind of thrilled that Toby had come looking for me. It was a bright, crisp day. The bell had just rung and kids were streaming out the doors. For a second, I thought about walking the other way, but I knew I had to get Toby to stop signaling to me. I didn't even want to think about what would happen if Greta saw him there, waving at me like we were best friends or something. I quickly looked down at what I was wearing. My boots from Finn, good. A long black corduroy skirt, iffy. And a maroon sweater that my mother said was three times too big on me, good. I glanced around again, and then I jogged over to the car, head down, trying to look as casual as I could. When I got to the car, Toby grabbed both my hands in his like we were long lost cousins. June, fantastic. I didn't realize it might be hard to find you, he said. Come on, get in. I stood next to the car for a few seconds, looking it up and down. My head was thinking that I shouldn't get in a car with this guy, who was almost a complete stranger. But my heart was thinking, what if there's a drop pencil in there, or a stray box of good and plenties, or a single strand of dirty blonde hair, or the imprint of the place Finn used to sit? What if there's a single atom of the air Finn used to breathe in there? I was still eyeing the car when Toby climbed in. He reached across the passenger seat, popped the lock open, and pushed the door open for me. I looked over my shoulder. Kids were coming from every direction, but I couldn't see anyone who might care what I was doing. And so I threw my backpack on the floor of the car and climbed in. The car smelled of cigarette smoke and berries fake strawberries, and I saw it was because Toby was chewing a huge wad of bubble gum. He was wearing a too small tweed jacket, and underneath it he had on a green t-shirt with big saguaro cactuses printed all over it. I could tell that Finn had made that shirt, and I must have stared at it a little too long because Toby, Toby tugged the jacket close around his body. He gave me a sly smile and nodded. I knew you wouldn't ring. Well, no, no, don't worry. I understand. I'm just some stranger to you. It's my fault. I gave Toby the narrow, barest narrowing of my eyes. Well, I'm just some stranger to you too, right? So whatever. Of course you are, he said. He stared at me for a few seconds, like he was considering telling me more. Then he smiled and twirled his hand in the air. You're right, like you said, whatever. Toby reached into his jacket pocket and pulled out a chunky piece of gum and offered it to me. Thanks, I said. He looked out the window. I suppose it was a bad idea, me coming here. I shrugged. You're an adult. You can go wherever you want. I regretted it right away. It was such a little kid thing to say. I waited for Toby to call me on it, but instead he smiled. Then he turned to look at me. And what about you then? What about me? Well, can you go wherever you want? I looked down at my backpack. My heart raced. This whole thing was so far beyond my normal life. Here I was in Finn's old car with this boyfriend of Finn's, who everyone in my family seemed to hate. Here I was doing something really, really wrong. But when I looked up, there was Toby's warm smile and his brown eyes and a look that was somehow saying that if I said yes, everything would be okay. How could that be right? I glanced around the car. I looked across the dashboard and at the steering wheel and on the floor. Then my eye caught the gear shifter and a smile welled up in my chest. Glued right there, right on top of that gear stick, was a tiny blue hand. 
the tiny hand of a smurf. I reached out and laid a finger on top of it. There was a brand new piece of fin I'd never seen before. I peeked over at Toby and thought that this must be just the beginning. There must be hundreds of little things like this, thousands maybe, and Toby was my way in to see them. And so, with the bare tilt of my head, I nodded. Of course I can, I said. Why wouldn't I be able to go wherever I want? <laughs> so, I will show you, I well, these are up on my website as well, but one of the things that was kind of interesting about writing this was um, writing with just from my own imagination and coming across things that actually seemed to be almost exactly like what I had written or what I had imagined in the real world. Um, one of the things is this portrait. It's um, called Two Schoolgirls by a Scottish painter called James Cowie. And I was just, I did quite a bit of research, not scholarly research, but just, I tried to look at a lot of portraits. I tried to go to London and go to the National Portrait Gallery, you know, at least a couple times a year, just to wander around and think, what, what is it about the portraits that really give you a little bit of a, like you're, like you're seeing into somebody else. Um, and I bought a book there, and I was just thumbing through it on the train on my way home, and there was this, um, which to me is about as close as you can get. I mean, it's, it was exactly what I had imagined um, the portrait that Finn's painting to be like. And in fact, there's actually right in there, there's kind of the idealized form of a man, which you've read the book, that's very much who Finn is, this ideal figure, kind of coming right between the two girls. And um, I was just thrilled when I found this. <laughs> I'll pass it around if anyone wants to have a, have a look. Um, so I'm going to ask that, what, what inspired it? But it seemed to me totally the opposite. I just ran, made one, well, ran, okay, not randomly, but I, I imagined and the things in the world would kind of fill in that spot. So this was my Toby, which again was a portrait that I'd, I'd seen. And this, I don't know, I don't want to spoil what you might picture Toby to look like because, you know, it's, that can be very personal. But this to me was so, this is Lucy and Troy portrait was so Toby for me, um, and I kind of wish I could have better technological um, skill, I could have it up there. But um, this portrait is called um, Portrait of um, John Minton, and John Minton was an actor, illustrator, a bit of a low-level artist in around the time, I think it was like the 20s. Um, he had commissioned Lucian Freud to paint this portrait, um, and then five years later he committed suicide. So I saw this, I didn't know any of the tragic history of it, but I think it's all in there. He was also gay, persecuted a bit for his homosexuality, um, never really succeeded enough as an artist, and it's a, kind of a very sad story in a way, his life story. And it just, it felt like it was just such a perfect, perfect kind of embodiment of who I saw Toby um, being. Um, the other thing, uh, later, in, later on in the story, um, Toby gives June the medieval woman's book of days, um, <laughs> which which she loves and treasures. And that was one of those things. That was one of those snowball rolling down a hill. And I, you know, it was one of those teenage things. I had it. I someone must have given it to me. Unfortunately, no special, super special uncle, but um, gave me this, and I loved it as a teenager. And I I wondered if it was still out there somewhere. And apparently, yes, eBay. <laughs> it's still out there, the exact same book, um, and it it was just like amazing to be able to actually hold something that felt like so part of the story. Um, June, in, later in the book, kind of describes her relationship with Toby as being like like the nurse, this painting nurse um, feeding sick man, um, which is in there, and also. So people have read the book will probably will, will recognize that. But if you look through also, um, this is the, these are all women doing medieval things. This is writer. <laughs> She's, she looks actually much more ill than the sick man. <laughs> Very tortured and ill and pale. And I just thought, yeah, that about sums it up. Um, so um, that's actually quite good. So I'll pass it. Um, Another thing about Toby, I've, I've you know asked if he was kind of again the inspiration thing. Um, 
about a year after writing it. So the first draft of this book would have been about a half the length of the finished book. Um, I'm, a, I'm a putter in her, so a lot of writers are write and write and write and then edit down, but I'm, I seem to be the opposite, write quite clean and spare and then add and deepen. Um, Toby, and actually even that picture, I feel sure now, and I feel actually quite stupid for, for this not dawning on me sooner. Um, when I was in eighth grade, we had a teacher come to our school who was an exchange teacher from London. He taught English for a year. Very tall, lanky guy, like really Adam Zachary. <laughs> like that picture, that, like that Freud portrait. Um, he, we, we liked him. He was English, he was different, and he was, he was quite funny, good sense of humor. He left at the end of the school year, and about you know, maybe three or four months later, we heard that he died. He was, you know, maybe late 30s. And I hadn't had a lot of brushes with death as a teenager. I feel like I've been fortunate. Um, and so to have someone that you knew relatively well, that was in your life on a daily basis, uh, die, felt quite shocking. But then a few weeks after that, the word was going around that he had had AIDS. Um, and so, like I was talking about the suburban thing, for me, AIDS, that was the, I, I'm quite sure for most of the students, um, that was their first brush with this huge, scary specter that was in, I guess that would have been about 1986. Um, and so we had lived with AIDS in a way for a year. We had, I think that that was such a powerful memory and turn of events that um, my brain was trying to work that out all these years later. That like actually, you know, I was 40 and I'm still trying to figure out how that kind of impacted me. Um, and again, it wasn't like I would say, so if you say, did he inspire the story? <coughs> no, but I don't know. I, can, can something that you don't even know is happening inspire the story? Maybe. Um, it, was, it was one of those I'm in the shower moments realizing, oh my goodness, that's Mr. <coughs> from eighth grade. That's who I'm writing about. That's in some way who I'm writing about, um, which is what I love about writing, I think because there's all this subconscious stuff and you're just teasing it out and teasing it out and kind of figuring out what your preoccupations are. Um, yeah. So one other strand to this book, there's, and I get from readers, about 50% really kind of respond to the Toby and June relationship and the other 50% really respond to the June and her sister Greta relationship. Greta is quite evil for most of the book. Um, she's, she's not very nice. Um, and I get a lot of letters, people saying, my sister and I, my sister was just like that. <laughs> Even my sister wasn't just like that. Um, she's quite, quite harsh and, and horrible. And um, so I'll read you a little bit of that, of, of June and Greta. Um, it wasn't like I used to do something with Finn every weekend, but there was always the possibility. The phone could ring early in the morning, usually on a Sunday, and Phil would be on the other end, asking if anyone wanted to go out someplace. He always did that. Ask if anyone wanted to go, but I knew really he meant me. You're in love with Uncle Finn, Greta said one Sunday after he called. <coughs> He'd been watching me from the other side of the kitchen, watching my face light up as I listened to Finn saying it was a good day to go to the cloisters. After I hung up, Greta stood there for a second and smiled. Then she said that thing to me about being in love with Finn, and I could have punched her. I clenched my fists and shoved them deep into my pockets and walked out of the kitchen, but she followed. Everybody knows it. I stopped and closed my eyes, my back still to Greta. You know what I heard Mrs. Alphonse say, I said, she said? Mrs. Alphonse was a friend of my mother's from the garden club. My mother didn't even like gardening, but she still went to the garden club meetings one Thursday night a month to drink coffee and talk to other moms who probably also didn't do a lot of gardening. <laughs> my back was still to Greta, my fists pulling tighter and tighter. I heard her asking mom about you and Finn. It's a bit strange for a girl to spend so much time alone with her uncle, isn't it? Not that I'm saying there's anything funny going on. I don't mean that at all. That's what she said, but I could tell she meant that she thought something was very wrong with it. And I could tell she'd been talking about it with other moms. And poor mom, she didn't know what to say. My fists had started to loosen because I was listening so hard to Greta. But then I thought about Mrs. Alphonse with her stupid, tightly permed hair. Why did Mrs. Alphonse even need to think about me and Finn at all? <coughs> Just letting you know, that's all, what you're putting mom through and that everybody knows. 
Which everybody? I asked, though I hadn't meant to say a word. Well, if you think that Mrs. Alphonse wouldn't talk about it with Kimmy, you'd be wrong. And if you think Kimmy wouldn't tell like everybody she knew, well then whatever. Kimmy Alphonse was a girl in my class who seemed pretty average. I'd never even thought about her until now. So go on, meet up with your precious Uncle Finn. Enjoy yourself. I couldn't let Greta get away with all that. Let her yank every bit of joy from my Sunday without saying anything. There's nothing gross because Finn is gay and everybody knows it. I turned to see if I'd gotten Greta. If her smile would fade, but it didn't. It got wider. She waited a second and then said, I said you were in love with Uncle Finn. I didn't say Finn was in love with you, did I? And what could I say to that? Nothing, as <clears throat> usual. So that's kind of, that's also been interesting. Like, some readers find the, because I guess that's a little spoilery, but not like in a Da Vinci Code kind of way, <laughs> um, that June is actually, and well, in whatever way a 14-year-old can be, whether it's a crush or whether it's love to her, she's, Finn is kind of her first love. Um, and as a writer, I felt like it was sort of literal, that she literally was, whether it was a big crush or love, felt, and she's embarrassed about that. And that's what draw, that's actually the driver of a lot of the story. But I heard people feel a bit uncomfortable with that. I mean, nothing untoward actually happens in the book, but, um, and Finn is gay. Um, but really, people feel like that's not, that, that kind of sullied the book a little bit, to have that, but for me, that was the purest truth of the book about, how you don't, you can't really help who you fall in love with, and that those kind of, sh that probably everyone, if they're actually honest with themselves, has had experiences like that, where they um, feel something for someone where it's not really, you know, okay. And um, so it's interesting to feel that people, people find that like something that sullied an otherwise kind of more innocent tale, but um, to me that was the most true thing that I felt I had come to when I was writing this book. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do now is just see if anyone had questions. Um, and I'm happy to answer anything about the writing process, publication process, um, the story, anything. Yes? So did you have a classic hard time getting a publisher and or an agent? I, I had gotten a, um, someone she introduced me, um, an Arts Council grant and this New Writing Ventures Award. So I had, there were a few agents around, the New Writing Ventures Award, one of the things that they did, it's an English thing, is make a little folio of all the finalists writing, like little postcards with little snippets. And they sent it to loads of agents in the UK. And so um, quite a few agents actually contacted me. But I was only just starting this. It was maybe 20,000 words. So I was like, oh no, I'm missing my lifetime chance. To... But there was an agent, when it was, when it was done, she was, she was waiting. She said, yeah, send it to me. She loved it, asked me into London. <laughs> I met with her. I was all thinking, you know, I'm set. This is going to happen. Um, and then we talked for a long time. She just met with me for about two hours and gave me a lot of feedback, let me know that actually I'd written what I'd shown her was a first draft, which I don't think I had come to that um, realization at that time. Um, I, thought I couldn't actually think of what else I could add, but she gave me this amazing, so much amazing feedback, which made me go back. Um, so she didn't offer representation. So I spent another two years after that um, writing, and you know, all the best parts of the book was in those two years when I fully understood the story I was trying to tell. So I, I went back by that. By the two years later, probably wasn't what she had in mind. <laughs> she was thinking maybe six months. But um, so by that time, her list was full. But um, I started sending out a lot. I sent to about fifty agents, and in the end, I got three offers. Um, two of which said we'd send it out as is right now. We love it. And the third said, oh, I have like, like revisions. I want you to work on this stuff more. So of course I went with that one. <laughs> because what you want is someone who will call you on things. And um, I knew, every, every writer kind of knows there's things that you're kind of thinking, ooh, I hope no one notices that I didn't flesh that out enough. And um, so you really want someone who's gonna like say, yeah, I noticed, <laughs> go do it. So um, I, yeah, but once I had an agent, I did a really good revision with her and she sent the book out on a Friday, and on the Monday we had like multiple editors interested. Um, I had phone calls with editors at Knopf and you know Penguin and Viking and everywhere, and it was all kind of surprising. Um, so, and it's now it's sold in about 16 countries. So it's been like from it was it was surprising. Like I just had to get the book right, I think, and then 
it all. So maybe that's the moral. Get the book right, and it all kind of falls into place. Yes? One of my favorite parts of the book actually was the relationship between Greta and uh, the narrator. So I was curious, do you have siblings? Do you have sisters or brothers? I do have one sister, but <laughs> this relationship actually is up. Uh, and I thought about it. Of course I thought about it. Is this like us? It's not really like us at all. I think actually I'm both the geeky sister and the mean sister. I think I, those two is almost, when I look at it, it's kind of like two different parts of me. Um, I don't, I, I never really use real people. I don't, I know a lot of writers do model things very directly on real people. I didn't even, even subconsciously, they're not really like us. Um, so, but I do have one sister, which I felt like, oh, and it, interesting, I did at some point think, because as a writer, I was looking for like moral complexity. How can I make a choice that like opens things up, and makes it a little more complex? I thought, what if June's a boy? Um, and then there's all kind of weird tension with Toby, gay man, boy. But I thought, no, that's not the, that's not my story to tell. So I did keep it as two sisters. But I did know people were going to think that. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes? Could you talk a little bit about the dynamics uh, with the parents? Um, and and their, I mean, the girls were so independent um, yeah. throughout the story, but I, I, I was intrigued by the parent relationship. The parents, well, yes. the, the, in the story, the parents are, you know, a lot of things have a sort of time period, and this time period is tax season, which um, I don't think anyone's done tax season anymore. Um, but they're both accountants, and it's tax season, and I think as a writer, a lot of, I mean, a lot of, it's, it's a ch children's book trope to like kill off the parents or have the kids be orphaned. But I thought, how can I actually have these parents be a little less involved without making them, I didn't want them to be bad people. And I, I don't know how people feel about them in general. I thought they were basically decent, very busy parents during tax season. Um, and interestingly, um, Macmillan, my publisher in England, did a reading group panel and had readers come in. My book was the one chosen for this. Readers came in, talked about the book, and then I kind of came in later, a little frightening. <laughs> We've been talking about it for hours um, with no idea whether they were going to be like it or not. Um, and the thing that they came at me with was that kind of universally they felt like June's mother, Danny, was horrible and that she was responsible for all the negativity in the book, um, which I, you know, that's obviously readers interpret it as you want. But I found that quite shocking. For me, I had empathy for all of the characters. So um, if, if you read the book, you kind of see what Danny's reasons are, I think, towards the end. You understand she does make some choices that aren't fantastic. The parents are, the parents do probably turn a blind eye. I think they turn a blind eye, but I think they trust the girls. I think the girls are good girls. They're not, um, even Greta, who's not that good a girl. Like, I think they trust them. Yes. So keep begging on that. The whole backstory with the mother and her, you know, sort of thwarted artistic career and her relationship with the with her brother. At what point in your writing was that? Right in the in the core first draft, or was that something that got flushed out later? That was later. I that think. And the thing. I, okay, spoiler. <laughs> the thing with the um, portrait with her at the end for people who have read it. That was. Probably one of the, it's one of my favorite things in it, and it's actually one of the very last, like, I can't think of what I could put in this book anymore. My editor said, I want a little more redemption for the mom. And I was like, oh, there's so many cheesy ways to handle that. Like, you know, a, like a, a huggy, cryy scene. But I was like, I just had that revelation that she would add to the portrait as well as the other. And, um, and it was perfect. It just, and that that's the one that doesn't get, yeah, I don't want to spoil it, but yeah, I, I was, it, it felt like, you know, it was one of those moments where you think, wow, this is just kind of, this is just so right for this story. Um, but no, that was quite late, the backstory with the mom. I think I had a bit of the Finn and, and her thing, but not, not the artistic side to her. I didn't, I kind of realized that there has to be, there has to be more than just, she's, she's just not nice, so, yeah. Yes. I've not finished the book, but I did read the section where she goes into the woods and at one point she hears will, the, the, well, the wolves from different directions. And I was wondering why you, the title came to you. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, you know I get a lot of letters from readers asking me to explain the title. And I'm still, I'm not really sure if I, if I should. <laughs> it's my job, you know. Um, it's probably, it's, you know, like writing papers and stuff. 
Um, well, when did it come to I, you? It came to me quite randomly, actually. It, I was walking. The wolves in the woods were there for a long time, and I felt like they were a metaphorical thing. It's, you know, fear and jealousy. The wolf, the name of the painting, the portrait is called Tell the Wolves I'm Home. So there's that layer. And then way at the end, kind of page 323, June, it's, get, it's quite, I think it's, I think it's explicit enough. It, it, I mean, the sentence is basically, tell the wolves I'm home. I guess that's what it means, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so, um, which I won't, I, find, I feel like figuring out what the title is, is part of, it's like another thread in the story. But it came, I was just walking one day, it had been called Uncle Finn as a working title for a very long time. I knew that wasn't gonna be the real title, but I didn't, I didn't have the right thing. And just that phrase, almost like you get a snatch of poetry, came to me and I thought, wow, that's, there's some, I, I love that turn of phrase. And um, wrote it, stuck it on the top of the manuscript. And then I think I started to bend the manuscript to, understand what I meant by that title. So by the end, I mean, I guess, I, I guess I, I'll just, I mean, I, to me, the wolves of the title are all the things that you are ashamed and embarrassed about. It's tell the wolves I'm home or they'll find you anyway, kind of, is the sentence towards the back of the book. Um, if you don't kind of own up to all of your feelings and all of your, and just have them fester, like you'll, it's like, it's like wolves <clears throat> coming to get you anyway. The, it's, it, it'll come out anyway in, in different ways. So um, that's where I kind of finally understood that I was trying. So it was again, it was like, again, my subconscious throwing something out and then me kind of working my way, scrambling my way to figure out what I was, what I was actually thinking. Yes. Yes. Um, I think you said that the book has been um, translated into umpteen languages and picked up umpteen countries. Um, are you getting feedback as to what it is that they're responding to? I, I, well, it's only barely come out. I think maybe Sweden and Taiwan. So there's a Chinese edition and a Swedish edition. Um, the rest are, it's, it's foreign is very slow. Well, in my case, anyway. Um, in Sweden, actually, I did, you don't always, sometimes you just get an email saying, oh, you know, Polish rights have sold. You never, you don't really talk to anyone there. But Sweden, there was an auction for it in Sweden because apparently a couple years ago there was a multi-volume AIDS novel that was a big hit. So um, I'm a little intimidated by that, to tell you the truth. But um, that's why they were kind of quite responsive to this book. A lot of countries are publishing it as YA. Um, that's another thing. So. Here it's here and in the UK it's published as adult. Although I think a lot of people still, I don't think that's always clear. I think bookshelf bookshops are shelving it in both. Um, I don't think it's always 100% um, firm firm adult. But that so I haven't heard. I occasionally hear from foreign readers, but just kind of in a similar way that I hear from. Yeah. Yes. Um. Sort of one two question. Um, you seem like you're very sentimental, like you have the, have the visuals and you sort of know how to cultivate what you want to do. And then you also sort of said you didn't want to do sort of the regular autobiography. Maybe you're sort of trying to stick away from the cliche, but what you created is so rich and like coming from short story to novel. Um, I guess like did you struggle like with how much you were giving? Or like, like when you knew you were writing a novel instead of a short story, right? Like, like emotionally. Do you do now, or like? I think you have to be all in. Kind of when you, I cried so much. But towards the end of this, I cried copy editing. <laughs> so I, I'd already written it. A time had passed, and you know, I got the copy editing, and I was rereading it, and I was just right back there. I mean, I was no. I I guess. What was nice about it at the time, and people always say this, when it's your first book, you have all this freedom. You kind of don't think anyone's going to read it. <laughs> to tell you the truth, you kind of, I, mean, I was thinking a handful of people might read it. Um, so I didn't feel as vulnerable as I would feel with, say, this next book that I'm working on. And I think the issues will crop up more with that, knowing that actually people might buy it and read it. Um, but I think that that's probably that vulnerability and kind of allowing myself to really like expose, you know, emotion on the page is what's making it kind of appealing. But, yeah. Do you feel sorry? Do you feel like you're going to stick now with novels, or do you still have that like fear? Yeah, probably because I think if I'm honest, I mean that that's what I like to read. I mean I prefer novels. I love a really well crafted short story, but um, I like also having readers. <laughs> so <laughs> short stories, even unless you're Alice Munro, who just won the Nobel Prize. Right. Um, I'm not Alice Munro. 
Um, so unless you are someone like that, really, you're working short stories. One short story can take me as long as you know a first draft of a novel. So to get it right, and no one, I mean, it's a handful of readers. So I think just my own practicality. I and I do love novels. It, yeah. Yes. Um, I was going to ask you what. If Tell the Walls on Home was my book of two years ago, tell everybody, I love this book. What is your book that you loved oh, in the oh, last, oh, I don't know, five years? Like really recent. Um, what's my book? Um, oh, God. You know, I actually get sent a lot of books now to read, so I'm trying to think of one. I've been reading tons of nonfiction, really? so actually like Henrietta Lacks. I, I, I'm always behind. I'm not like reading the very, very last. So I loved that. I loved... Um, I guess I have my, my long term. I you know things. It, you love things in different ways. Like I loved Gone Girl in the like <laughs> Gone Girl way. I love um, Henrietta Lacks and like wow, this this window on this whole world. I don't have one. It's always kind of evolved. I you know I went to see Jeanette Walls a few oh. months ago, and she said her book that was so inspiring as she grew up was A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Oh, I didn't a grow in Brooklyn. So I got it out. I'm actually just finishing it. Now. Yeah. It amazing. Oh, a grow. Oh, I thought you meant like actually well, did, really, like new releases. Like, like, like yeah. um, oh, as a kid, I loved Never Ending Story, the book before the film. I loved Wrinkle in Time. I loved lots of escapist stuff. Um, Harriet the Spy. Yeah. Probably yeah, <laughs> Harriet the Spy. <laughs> I'd say maybe my top one. Yes. I've asked of other other um, novelists that have come here to speak. Um, would you consider writing children's? Um, you know, when I was writing this, I started out, I didn't know if it was going to be YA or adult. I didn't care. You know, everyone says, just write the story and figure it out later. So, um, YA would probably be as children's as I would go. Um, but the next book that I have in mind is definitely adult. So, I, so probably not. You know, actually, when I started this, when I, now that you're asking me that, I was working on another novel, which was kind of middle grade, and it just wasn't me. I couldn't get the voice, I think. You need, even if you have a great idea, it has to be the book for you to write in a way. So it didn't. I so probably not. Not out of any reason. Just it doesn't seem like that's what I do best. But, yes. Are there any messages or thoughts behind the characters' names? Is what you think about how you created them? Sadly, no. <laughs> just pretty much a lot of questions that people ask me like that. Actually, no, it was random. <laughs> it was. Um, no, you. I just. I didn't do a look up all the meanings and see who they were. Um, those were just the names that sometimes you just actually. And I, you know, I don't know what other writers do, but you just. You're writing. You have a vision. You just stick a name on, and then that name starts to stick. Like, and unless there's a reason you have to change it for, you know, you realize, oh, that's a celebrity. <laughs> you know, you you just that name starts to stick, and it becomes like it grows into the book. So. Oh, I, I'm kind of, ideas? I'm such a bad, well, yeah, I have ideas and I'm working on it, but I'm the worst verbal pitcher of my, I mean, you should have heard when people ask me what that was about, what I, I mean, it didn't, it didn't exactly, you know. I think we all feel that way. It was a great book, what's it about? Oh, <laughs> yeah, and so I'm not even going to because I don't want to see the glazing over of your eyes and you're like, oh God, that sounds like the worst idea. Like, that will just, yeah, I, so even my agent doesn't know the exact, you know, doesn't know, I'm not, she listens to pitches all the time, and so I'm completely terrified to watch her face as I'm pitching her. <laughs> so basically, I can write, I can Random House will probably take the next book on a partial. So I want to get it, but I want, which means you write for an all for your first novel. I don't know if you know, you have to pretty much write the whole novel and then just hope for the best, which, you know, there's a lot of faith involved in that. So if your first novel book does quite well, then they want a second novel from you, and you can just kind of give a little bit of a synopsis and maybe 50 pages. So I'll be able, if I get a good 50, 100 pages down, I, I'll be, then I'll tell them, I, I mean, I have, but it not in a, not in a, let me compact that into a really snazzy pitch sentence for you yet. <laughs> All right, yes. Do you, do you dream your novel? Do I dream my novel? Do you dream this novel? Um, Parts of it? Only the very, very end, and I've heard this from other writers, that in the last 20 or 30 pages, you almost can't sleep. You're, you're, you see the end, and you, um, but not, 
not the rest of it feels quite kind of workmanlike. You have to sit there, you have to write, you have to delete, you have to write. Um, but towards the end, it almost becomes a bit feverish, and for me, anyway. You captured um, the voice of a coming of age um, woman, young lady in this book, and I'm just wondering, have your um, short stories, or maybe this new novel, does it have a similar like coming of age theme to it? Do you tend to gravitate towards that? I'm really genre? drawn to teen narrators, but I've kind of stopped myself for the next one, unless I want to become a YA writer, basically. I mean, I think that adult books with teen narrators, you know, I, I've kind of, I have one that has another teen narrator, but I've forced myself not to because I think I need to do something quite different. I think it would be hard with a second teen narrator to not slip into June. So I wanted something, I mean, that, well, I will say that the, this novel I'm working on now, it's two brothers, so, um, and a parent, but <laughs> I'll, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> so no, I don't want to, I'm trying to like, that's actually, even this trip is me kind of drawing a line under Top of Wolves a little bit and trying to do something quite, it won't be different, like it's not going to be a, a horror book or something, but, but something that lets me mentally move away from this a bit. I love when you discovered a part of Finn that she didn't know when she went down to the basement mm -hmm. and discovered his little room. Was that in your first section of, of writing the book or in I'm trying to think now. I think I think that wasn't in the first section. I think the first section was quite. It was like almost like those indie movies where people kind of act a bit quirky and go around the city, <laughs> like yeah, crazy together. It was very light. It was still a full story and like very readable, but it didn't have depth. It didn't have all of. I think all of the coolest stuff is is in is later when I. There's a quote from someone, and I need to find out who it is one day. The first draft is the writer telling herself the story, and the subsequent draft is the writer telling the reader the story. And so I was just trying to feel out the bones of it. And then all of the rest of it is like that filling in and making it real and 3D. And um, just, you know, you know these people by then. So you know, oh, well, you know, maybe, maybe this and that. And that's when your imagination kind of really. So no, that was surprising. Even the jealousy, June being jealous of Toby wasn't really in the first draft. I, I don't even, I, I should look at the first draft because it was probably pretty obvious it was a first draft now in hindsight. <laughs> <laughs>